This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. 76 tribal and urban Indian organization sites across the country are receiving the just approved Janssen COVID-19 vaccines. The FDA has determined that the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, also called the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, has met the standard criteria. The data provides clear evidence that the vaccine may be effective in preventing COVID-19 for those over 18 years. The Janssen vaccine only needs a single dose instead of the two vaccine protocol for Pfizer and Moderna versions. President Joe Biden said Tuesday that with the addition of the Janssen vaccine, he expects that every American will have access to a vaccine by the end of May. Texas became the biggest state to lift its mask rule, joining a rapidly growing movement by governors and other leaders across the U.S. to loosen COVID-19 restrictions, despite pleas from health officials not to let their guard down just yet. The Lone Star State will also do away with the limits on the number of diners who can be served indoors, said Republican Governor Greg Abbott. The governors of Michigan, Mississippi, and Louisiana likewise eased up on bars, restaurants, and other businesses, as did the mayor of San Francisco. What's interesting is how different tribal governments have addressed the pandemic. A recent collection of case studies by the Native Governance Center in Minneapolis documented community closures, including regional parks and even public highways. Top health officials, including the heads of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have responded to Texas by begging people not to risk another deadly wave of the contag contagion just when the nation is making progress vaccinating people and that victory over the outbreak is in sight. U.S. cases have plunged more than 70% over the past two months from an average of nearly 250,000 new infections a day, while average deaths per day have plummeted about 40% said mid January. But the two curves have leveled off abruptly in the past several days and even re risen slightly. And the numbers are still running at alarmingly high levels with an average of about 2,000 deaths and 68,000 cases per day. Health officials are increasingly worried about virus mutations. A student at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas, is fighting for his First Amendment right to freedom of speech. Jared Nolly is asking Haskell Indian Nations University, a public institution operated by the federal government, to answer for the 90 days he was silenced without any due process under a directive that banned him from engaging in basic acts of journalism. I've really had to learn uh, a lot about my rights uh, and the roles of journalism and it's definitely been like an experience of growth and i know that's what universities are for unfortunately this shouldn't be the learning opportunity that student journalists need to learn some of those skills um, to learn the value of free speech and a free press this all started in october haskell president ronald graham issued a personally signed directive to nolly threatening him with disciplinary action for requesting information from government agencies and for failing to treat members of the Haskell community with the highest respect after he published articles critical of the university. The Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, Nally and the Indian leader officially filed the federal lawsuit this week. I'd say my relationship prior to the directive with the administration and press um, was just really that like silent treatment. But I think it really is the way Haskell tries to manage its own message um, it is just to respond uh, without a response to media inquiries. The leader of the Cherokee Nation is asking Jeep to stop using the Cherokee Nation's name on its Cherokee and Grand Cherokee SUVs. Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. said in a statement first reported by Car and Driver magazine, that he believes corporations and sports teams should stop using Native American names, images, and mascots as nicknames or on their products. Kristen Starnes, a spokesman for Jeep's parent company, Amsterdam-based Stellantis, said in a statement that the vehicle name was carefully selected and nurtured over the years to celebrate Native American people for their nobility, prowess, and pride. She didn't say whether the company was considering renaming the vehicles and she didn't immediately respond to an email 
requesting that information. Hoskins says the best way to honor the Talaka, Oklahoma-based tribe is to learn more about its history. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahan. We'll be right back. The Tamaquag Museum is on the move. In rural Exeter, Rhode Island, it's a hidden gem for the region. The museum's director, Lorenz Spears, shares plans to partner with the University of Rhode Island to build a new museum, a complex that will be accessible to all. The museum was founded in 1958 and is located in an old building that was once a farmhouse and a church. The $4 million capital campaign kicks off this fall. Welcome, Loren, and congratulations on the new project. Asui Kwasan, thank you. We're so excited to be here. This is exciting. Can you give us some background about the museum? Certainly. It was founded in 1958 by Eva Butler, who was an anthropologist, and Princess Red Wing, who was Narragansett Wampanoag, elder, ancestor, knowledge keeper, educator. So we've had this unique experience as an organization that has always had an indigenous voice. Maybe let's start by talking about the history of the tribe and why it's so important to share it with the nation and the community. Certainly, Tomaquag Museum as an independent nonprofit, we highlight the Narragansett, which I am a, a citizen of, and we also highlight tribes of Southern New England in our collection. So we have a very vast collection of our cultural belongings, which is a word we use to decolonize the word artifact and our archival collections of pictures and maps and writings and things of that nature. So we have a very extensive collection and we're really excited for more people to see more of that collection in our new facility, including having an archive research center where people um, that are researchers and academics and book authors and filmmakers can create their own works from this knowledge. You know, so much of our history just skips over uh, really the beginning of the uh, encounter with the uh, First Nations. I like the idea of uh, decolonizing. What are some of the other ways you do that with the museum? Certainly, we do actually a lot of professional development with school districts and other museums around decolonizing. We're actually working on a chapter for a book that is a collaborative that's on decolonization. And so we do a lot of work um, in the way that we represent ourselves in, in our exhibits in a decolonized way, but also in training others to start thinking about um, the words that they use and the representation that they create and also advocating for indigenous people through our indigenous empowerment network, which in our new facility will have its own building. Um, and the goal of that um, program is literally to take indigenous people out of poverty. In Rhode Island, we're five times below the white majority and three times below every other ethnicity. And I think that's crazy in the 21st century when we have such vibrancy in our communities and such knowledge, it's just that often you have to decolonize the process in order for people to respect the knowledge that people have and the contributions that they give um, and, and the impact that we've had on Rhode Island history and US history. Um, I say it over and over again, there's no US history without indigenous people's history. Um, and there's certainly no Rhode Island history without Narragansett Niantic history. So, something you, else you said intrigues me and that's the idea of indigenous knowledge and putting it on par with everything else. How does that happen with your museum? Well, I think we really respect our knowledge keepers, our artists, our culture bearers, and we really try to make sure that we can uh, find funding to remunerate them. And we also advocate that when other people are reaching out for these knowledge keepers, that they're remunerating them as well. Because often, uh, communities of color in general are disrespected for their knowledge that's about their community, their culture, their history in a way that they're not respected the way that um, quote unquote experts are. 
And I am saying these are the experts about our community. And so when other organizations want to reach out to them through Tomaqua Museum, we remind them of that and encourage them to uh, be respectful of their knowledge and of their time and to elevate their, their gifts where they belong. And so that's really important. And I think through our new facility, we'll be able to continue to grow that advocacy for indigenous knowledge and culture bearers and respecting those, those knowledge keepers. Um, that's really important. And to elevate um, the, the respect for the traditional ecological knowledge that our communities have and the access to the land and the resources that are there in, in a truly traditional and respectful way, that's really important. And, and having the 18 acres at the University of Rhode Island, um, it's still a rural space, but it's more conducive to access for tourists. It's on a bike path. Um, it's on a main thoroughfare where tourists would be going to the city of Newport um, and to the oceans by the town of Narragansett named after our people at the bay <laughs> named after our people and our nation. Um, that would be really important. And, and also to collaborate not only with the University of Rhode Island, but other uh, higher ed institutions in the region that we already collaborate with to help educate their students, um, particularly those that are going into history, anthropology, archaeology, education, so that we can break the trends and the misrepresentation that continues to be pervasive in those fields um, to ensure that our students, my very first grandson, who's two and a half, when he hits school, that they're not still being told we don't exist. Um, you know, the history for the Narragansett people is a very difficult history of detribalization in the 1880s, which took 101 years to rectify. But in doing so, there's all kinds of written uh, material by quote unquote experts that say we don't exist. And we had to really fight our way. And people like Princess Redwing and many of her contemporaries that were born in the late 1800s were fighting all through that time to ensure that we're here. And our stories in this museum now and in our future uh, facility will tell all those stories about um, the difficult things that we went through, but the triumphs and successes of people that have uh, ensured that we're still here and that we can continue on. And the work that I do is so that my grandchildren and great grandchildren to come will um, have this place that they can call their own, that they can see themselves in, that they can be part of as an intern through our IEN program, uh, Indigenous Empowerment Network program, and to um, feel validated and that schools will start to incorporate the knowledge that we're teaching them through the professional development, to incorporate that into their curricula, um, to ensure that history is talking, told in its totality. Tom, I got one a national medal for museum and library services. Um, how did that change your work? Wow, that was such an amazing opportunity. In 2016, the Institute of Museum and Library Services gave us the national medal. Um, and what it spoke to is that our little tiny museum in a very rural space had a very big reach in our network of partners that we created in order to uplift indigenous voice, history, culture, knowledge um, in the community. And it was through a lot of partnerships that we did that. And I think that those partnerships helped elevate our, our work and our mission in a way that really helped us get to this place with a new facility on the horizon um, and just deepened our commitment and our relationships across the region. You think about the challenges for a museum during a pandemic. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you've faced? Wow, I like everyone, we were all scared to death last March as to what we were gonna do and how we were gonna do it. But one of the things that I say, said with the board and our staff is, you know what? We've always been worker bees. You know, we've been a small organization. We've always been underfunded and underrepresented. So we just dug in and started calling up our friends and saying, hey, Funder A or B or C, can you help us out here and get us over this hump? And you know, we've created a lot of relationships with our local and regional foundations and, and funders, and they really did step up and help us over that hump. And we took advantage of you know PPP and some of those federal opportunities, and that really helped us 
get our feet under us. And then we transitioned to a lot of online programming. Um, you know, we did several series, children's hours and um, quarantine creatives where we interviewed native artists. We held native art contests online so that native artists could be uplifted. We switched our gift shop to from an in-store to a virtual platform um, so that we could continue to support the 30 plus local native artists that we've been collaborating with. And we just really, um, found other ways. We created small private tours. Our facility here is small, but from August to November, we did tiny smite private tours so that people could still come in the museum. We plan to reinstitute those in the spring when, when we're a little safer than we currently are. And um, we just started doing a lot of um, all our booked programs like tours and workshops and things like that for schools and other and museums and other institutions we've been doing virtually. And um, we just continue to find new ways to reach our audience. We made um, free things on our website and on our YouTube page. And of course, like everyone using social media to, to reach our audience and ensure that we were continuing to fulfill our mission to educate them about native history, culture, the arts, the environment, and you know our place from historical times through today on what's happening in Indian country, so. Well, we're running out of time, so I just have one last question, and I know this is putting you on the spot, but if you were just to share a single message with uh, citizens of Rhode Island, what should they know about the communities there? You know, I think they should know that the indigenous community is extraordinarily vibrant, resilient, uh, knowledgeable in their culture and in their history, and that they have been contributing to what we call Rhode Island and what we call the United States for thousands upon thousands of years before the United States and this state even became a thing. So I think that we are in this landscape. Our stories are here, our culture is here, our knowledge is here, and we're um, just stewards of it in this generation. We're very thankful for our elders and our ancestors that have passed it on to us today. And it's our job to pass it on to the next generations that come. And we wanna share that knowledge with them in this case, through this museum and through this pro these programs. And our new facility will help us to do that even better. Well, congratulations. Thank you, Lorreen Spears. Thank you so much, Katapatash. And we'll be right back. Holly Cook Macaro is a partner at Spirit Rock Consulting, and she's a familiar face. She's a regular contributor to Indian Country Today, and she helps us understand what's going on in Washington. Welcome, Holly. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mark. So this week, the President of the United States announced that the vaccine rollout is uh, ramping up with the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that we could have uh, every American who wants one having a vaccine by May. That's pretty significant. It's very significant. I think that tribal economies are still recovering from the pandemic that began. It, it, it's, we are all, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of when everything really shut down, March 13th, it, which is when uh, I think maybe the last time that there was a large tribal leader gathering in Washington DC was that week with NIGA. Everybody went home on, on Thursday or Friday and boom, that's when it shut down. And many of the tribal gaming operations and other economic um, enterprises of the tribes were as a result shut down as well. So across the country, that slowdown of revenue and, and, and these revenues not only support the local economies, in many instances, they also support the, they keep the tribal government operations in the black. Those, those revenue transfers that come from the gaming operations, in addition to providing the, and for instance, in the Great Plains, some of the operations in the Midwest, they are major employment centers um, for, for tribal members as well. So with the vaccine coming on and with the, what has largely been applauded as a successful distribution in Indian country, although I will note there have been, um, 
problem areas across the country where it has not been so equitably distributed or as quickly. But uh, creating that new safe environment, both for uh, the, the communities surrounding uh, tribal communities that uh, take advantage of the gaming operations uh, and, and otherwise contribute to the tribal economies. I think this timeline, we are March, uh, early March here, that's only a couple of months away. I think it bodes really well for the continued economic recovery. That in combination with the pending relief bill in the Senate, which contains, as we've talked about, that it, very significant infusion of new resources uh, in relief funds. Well, in fact, this whole idea of coming out of the pandemic makes that relief bill even more important. Yes, exactly. And the relief bill, I don't, I don't, because of the guardrails of the budget reconciliation process, which is arcane, not very um, easy to track, but the, um, I don't expect the language, the base language that we are looking to and tracking very closely in, relies, in regards to tribal governmental relief funding and the other funds that are going to, on the federal side, IHS, BIE, BIA, uh, the 28 billion in total, I don't expect that language to change very much because it has already successfully gone through parliament, the parliamentarians review. So the, the things that I expect to change in this bill are really the larger things, the minimum wage, et cetera, those big policy issues that are gonna be debate, debated on high. Uh, those funds are going to have more flexibility They've got what we hope are going to be long, longer timelines in terms of how the administration provides the uh, the, the regulations and, and determines the eligible, eligible use requirement, requirements. So all of those things are going to be on the table, but the increased vaccine, the, the relief funds, the uh, infusion of new resources that are going to really continue to bolster up the economies, and also the 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 dollar amount of these of these funds that are coming in the relief bill. They are we had eight billion in the CARES Act, and now we have twenty billion going to tribal governmental relief. That amount of funding is going to provide tribes the ability to do some long term planning, long term infrastructure. We are hoping that those, those uses are allowed as we do the consultation with Treasury in the coming weeks. That's really interesting. And then I understand that this plays into the nomination of uh, Representative Deb Holland for Interior Secretary. There's politics involved. It, it very much does. The, uh, it actually in a number of ways, and I will go through on the House side first. So the House passed the bill last early last Saturday morning. Uh, in the in the early early morning hours, and uh, and sent it over to the Senate. When they passed when they passed the House, it still contained the minimum wage provision, which is largely dead now. They even abandoned the Plan B piece, so uh, it will be stripped by the Senate parliamentarian as not being in line with the budget reconciliation guidelines or rules. And then so it will have to go back to the House because they've made changes. We do expect a few other changes as well. And that means that the House will have to pass it again, which they're expected to quickly do. They're working in close coordination. But as you will recall, the bill passed the House with 219 votes. And Speaker Pelosi needs 218 to get a bill through that chamber. So they, there is what I understand to be an agreement or an understanding that Speaker that Congresswoman Holland will not be confirmed before she is able to cast that vote in the House. Because, Speaker, because that minimum wage provision has been stripped, there is a chance that other um, more liberal Democrats who that was a main priority for, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York, AOC as we know her, uh, they may lose folks like her, her vote. They are going to need and make sure that Congressman Holland's vote is there for the relief bill when it comes back to the House. On the Senate side, the dynamics have been quite interesting uh, in terms of the support for Deb and for Congresswoman Holland. I think we all know her as Deb. She's been so familiar to us and, and so accessible to our communities um, in her time in the House. So I, uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I do think it, a lot of us know her as Deb. So the, um, 
the dynamics over there shifted significantly when after her hearings last week, Senator Joe Manchin, the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, indicated his support with a very strong statement. That was very helpful. That was really the vote that said, we are good to go. So we do still hope to make it a bipartisan vote, both coming out of the committee and on the floor of the House. And the vote is on Thursday. So I think in the next uh, 24 hours, we will know where she lands. But she also, as a, very, as a centrist member of the Republican caucus in the Senate, she also has some, some items in play in the relief bill. She continues to seek language uh, regarding the Alaska Native Corporations or the ANCs, which were the subject of both consternation from tribal leadership and litigation, litigation that is currently in front of the Supreme Court. So she has a bit of leverage in terms of whether they need to vote for the relief bill. Holly cook Macaro, thank you as always. Yes, thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world today. I'm Mark Trahant, we'll be back tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.